What's going on guys? This is Empty Box, and this is the third part of a series of videos I will be doing on the American Open Wheel Civil War. In this episode, we're talking about the breakup between CART and Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the formation of the Indy Racing League, or as it is more commonly known, the split. Everything in the previous two episodes in this series comes to a head in this one, so if you aren't familiar with how this even came to be, I'd suggest starting there before you get there. The links are in the description. Then again, it made no sense anyways from the start, so what do I know? Even before the start, I'm going to just go ahead and say this, though. This is one of the most incredibly divisive topics in racing. Calling my shot a bit here, but I can guarantee you the comment section will already prove what this meant and what it still means all these years later. Enter Tony George, appointed president and CEO of his family's racetrack, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, in 1989. For those of you guys keeping score at home, Tony George is the grandson of Tony Holman, the man who brought the Speedway back after World War II, and stepfather of Ed Carpenter, current IndyCar team owner and part-time driver. With Tony at the wheel of the Speedway, things began to change in the relationship between the teams and CART. While previously their relationship had largely been one of, well, we need the teams and you need a big race, we can both benefit mutually, what Tony saw didn't match what he envisioned for the Indy 500. We need to discuss this right up front, then we can at least give context to his actions and what was going on from the Speedway side of things. For one, the racing had become too expensive, creating a top-heavy series dominated by a few teams who wielded the political power in the series due to their position. The drivers were becoming increasingly international, but perhaps even more importantly than just there weren't enough Americans, the Americans that were coming into the CART series, and therefore Indianapolis for the 500, were no longer the short track, you know, sprint and midget car drivers, the USAT guys of the past, but now more so road racers going oval racing. And while this was happening, the series itself had evolved from being a primarily oval racing series with a couple of road races thrown in there to a primarily road course street circuit series with some oval races thrown in there. Obviously this didn't benefit you know, Indianapolis Motor Speedway and USAC which was a oval racing primarily sanctioning body. And last but certainly not least, the cars had just become too fast and dangerous in a shifting world where killing drivers off like in the 50s and 60s could just be brushed aside. These four things would become essentially the white paper of the Indy Racing League. If we're being honest here, and while I love carts as much as the next guy and I make no secret of it, nothing in there was necessarily wrong, though perhaps idealistic at best. So now let's get into the action. Tony had no control within cart in the direction of the series. Cart was running the show as the Speedway was basically beholden to the teams. The 500 at that time was still the only show in town. It was the only race at the Speedway, it was the only source of revenue, and it was an incredible cash cow. He couldn't do jack, and the team owners knew that, and that's why Cart was formed in the first place. And so began one man's preparation for war. What could be done easily by the Speedway and USAC, without raising a lot of eyebrows as well, was create rules to favor the generally Indy 500 only guys to encourage more American born USAC driving IndyCar drivers. While the stock block engine rules, generally utilized by a lot of the Indy 500 only entries, had existed forever essentially, the rules could be tweaked to almost show preference to them. As mentioned in the previous episode, in 1991 the rules were altered in that a race bred, non stock block, push red actuated engine could be given additional boost. After several big crashes during the month of May in 1992, the Speedway would be minorly altered for 1993. For years prior, drivers had begun to use and abuse the apron at the bottom of the track, effectively widening the corners, shortening the lap and speeding up the cars, as well as giving the cars a further distance to hit the wall even harder. This is when the, sh the warm-up lanes would be added, shortcutting the corners uh, for entry and exit off of pit road, uh, the rumble strips at the bottom of the banking cut in and then the grass added. Basically that's when the track evolved into the layout that we have today. This is something that a lot of drivers had been asking for, in particular the warm-up lanes, as it did make a positive improvement on track safety. You then get to 1993, which this is the year that Nigel Mansell came over. Uh, his rookie year in cart, he won the championship. A lot of people forget that he didn't dominate the road courses and the street circuits. It's primarily the ovals that propelled him to the championship. But uh, regardless, put yourself in Tony George's shoes here, okay? He's already seen this series in cart 
take his race, the Indy 500, in a direction that he doesn't want it to go. He's absolutely powerless to do anything other than what he can do within the month of May, basically, in the poll that that has. So at this point, things have basically escalated to an uncomfortable degree. Perhaps as big as Kart's announcement that Nigel Mansell would be racing in the series in 1993, the Speedway countered with the fact that NASCAR would be coming to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for 1994. No longer would the Indy 500 be the sole source of revenue. While NASCAR certainly could not even come close to the Indy 500, it would provide at least some form of backup plan for the Speedway. This had the effect of tipping the balance of power in Indianapolis Motor Speedway's favor, providing Tony George was willing to lay one of the world's greatest races and his family's legacy on the table. The chips were down. Throughout May 1993, the changes done to the track were noticed by everyone. The track had become effectively one groove now that the apron was gone. Passing wasn't really possible, and the effectively narrower corners with the narrower groove so passing would now need to be done on the straights, putting a premium on power. And so began the preparations by another party, Roger Penske. The pushrod engine rules had been largely ignored by the kart teams for years. The pushrod engines were only competitive at Indy, given that's where they got the extra boost, and while they were fast and qualified, no one had been able to make those engines work in the race because they were tremendously unreliable. But with the increased premium on straight line speed with the apron no longer being usable, a pushrod engine being given tons of advantages now, Roger and company realized that a pushrod engine can not only be competitive, but decimate the field. Working with his buddies at Ilmore in utmost secrecy, perhaps closer to that of a black military project than a race car, work began on the Ilmore 265E, a 3.43 liter V8 turbocharged pushrod engine designed for one purpose supreme domination of the 1994 Indy 500. First, Tony played his hand, announcing the formation of the Indy Racing League prior to the 1994 kart season, intending to begin racing in 1996. Kart now had the simple choice, either give in, back Tony from the edge, solve the divide, and pretend the Indy Racing League was never announced, or both would likely be doomed. Both sides knew what a split would likely mean. Then Roger played his hand in the month of May 1994. The Beast, the Ilmore 265E, would be unleashed. A nuclear bomb in an increasingly unstable climate. Now badged and referred to as the Mercedes-Benz 500i, this engine would produce north of 1,000 horsepower with the boost turned up. We're talking about so much power, they literally blew the tires off the rims in practice. Paul Tracy's turbo would fail in the race. Emerson Fittipaldi would make an error and throw the car into the wall in turn four quite late in the race. Alan Sir Jr. would take the victory. At the end, only Al and Jock Villeneuve would be on the lead lap, and mostly due to cautions, not due to how competitive they were. The Penske's had the field covered with ease. Team Penske, the exact opposite of the little guy, indie only team, had essentially taken the USAC rulebook designed to cater to that little guy and peed all over it. Penske and Elmore had simply read the rules set forth and designed an engine that conformed to rules. They didn't cheat. They didn't exploit a loophole. They just read the rules. As had Greenfield Racing, who also showed up with a pushrod special engine all of their own, though they failed to make the race. The rules were designed for this engine to exist, but not this engine. What was USAC to do? Shortly after the race in 1994, rumors started that for 1995, the 500i would be available to existing Ilmore customers for the month of May for $1 million, in addition to a full season Ilmore cart engine lease. Eventually, USAC stepped in and squashed it, to a great shame in my opinion. While the engine did not create the split, what it did do was solidify the divide that was already there. The point of no return had been reached. Then 1995 would roll around, and what can best be described as an amazing display of karma, Team Penske would fail to qualify for the Indy 500. The Penske chassis, which had dominated last year's race with the Pushrod 500i engine, just were not up to snuff when stripped of that massive power advantage. The Indy Racing League has started to shape up. The first half season, starting in January 1996 and ending at the Indy 500 in May 1996, was announced. 
Uh, of particular note, the cars would be 1995 and earlier cart equipment. They were originally planning on running slightly smaller engines, but it was determined that the cost in changing the engines would just be simply put too much and would detri be detrimental to the goal of being cost-effective racing. It's also interesting to note that given that they were racing 1995 spec cars in 1996, they had to acquire those cars from somewhere. And what actually ended up happening is a lot of the big kart teams who had been buying a new car every season uh, with all the updates to enable it to be the most competitive as possible actually sold off their 1995 spec machinery at the end of the 1995 season because it was going to be basically irrelevant and obsolete to them. This was a huge advantage to the Indy Racing League in that initial uh, month of May in 1996 essentially because, well, nobody cared about the Indy Racing League except for that one race in May. The Speedway would also be repaved in this time frame, which would enable crazy speeds for the 1996 Indy 500. Now, what I always kind of wondered, and what I don't really know, and I don't think anybody necessarily absolutely concrete for sure, no pun intended, knows is, which one was it? Was it because the Speedway needed to be repaved and it was simply time to repave it? And the political landscape of the time was just unfortunate, you know, background to the repaving. And how much of it was, we're going to go ahead and erase those cart guys clean off the lap record board and just wipe, <laughs> wipe the speedway clean of those cart scum guys and what they've done to the speedway. I don't know. Personally, I think it is kind of a little bit more of the second of the two, but... And most controversially of all, the 25-8 rule. This rule basically stipulated that the Indy 500 field would no longer be the 33 fastest eligible cars to qualify for the race, but now the top 25 in the Indy Racing League season points would be locked in, and then the additional fastest 8 would be tacked on to get to the 33. This would prevent the powerful kart teams from coming over, running in the Indy 500, and cherry-picking the event, because the kart teams were far far, far stronger than any of the teams in the Indy Racing League. While they technically could still race in the Indy 500, the kart owners were so insulted by this that the top 25 in this meaningless series no one cares about and nobody asked for except for one guy. It, those 25 guys are going to be locked into the field in the greatest race in the world. And you're going to lock out the biggest names. It was an insult. It was a tremendous insult, and Kart's reaction was simple. They scheduled a race. This race would go one bigger than the Indianapolis 500 in theory. Rather than racing at Indianapolis, a track that was already incredibly fast with an Indy car, they would go ahead and race at Michigan. You know, wide, flat, two-mile oval, really incredibly fast track. And rather than just being the Indianapolis 500 track, like a race named after a city, I mean, that's small. They went, the U.S. 500. Like, everything bigger. Bigger, yeah! And then on top of that, they'd have the race the same exact day. They'd start the race just a little bit later on in the day, by about two hours after the start of the Indy 500. That way, by the time the Indy 500 was winding down, the kart race was on. Oh, my goodness. The war was on. Hope you guys enjoyed, because none of us fans got to. I right, bye.